Uh, I'd like to talk to you now about the de Broglie hypothesis. Uh, doesn't that sound like an episode name of uh, Big Bang Theory? I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but uh, they tend to have um, really funny names, uh, titles of episodes. But de Broglie hypothesis is actually a real thing. There's a guy named de Broglie, and uh, what he wondered was this. If, well, we've seen examples of light, uh, or sorry, we've seen examples of waves behaving like particles. He was wondering then, can particles behave like waves? And the answer is yes. So that's the key thing here is that um, particles can behave like waves. And of course, waves can behave like particles. So in other words, what this does is it helps us to understand what we call the wave-particle duality of light. See, light can behave like one or the other, and that's because waves can act like particles and particles can act like waves. Uh, this may seem a little bit weird, but um, it turns out, for example, that um, electrons can diffract, for example. This sounds maybe like not much of a big deal, but check it out. Uh, we were looking at diffraction before with light coming in, but this time let's say we have electrons coming in. And I have some sort of wall here with a little slit. And we were doing this with light, but imagine you're just shooting electrons, like one after the other. And it turns out somehow these electrons can actually interfere with each other. What? And they can actually make this diffraction pattern. In other words, you know, these things where we have lots more electrons in the center and then a space and then some more over here. In other words, somehow electrons can actually sort of split up and then interact with each other and interfere constructively or destructively with each other. This is totally weird. It's really hard to wrap our brains around it, but it turns out electrons really do diffract. So that's just mind-blowing. Um, and that's because electrons, which are you know, particles, or so it's thought, they can behave like waves. Normally diffraction is reserved for wave-like things. Uh, so that's really weird. Uh, we also have that uh, light, which is, you know, thought to be a wave or a particle, depending on the situation. It can have momentum. This might also seem really weird because we're used to seeing momentum as P equals MV. You know, the the momentum of something, let's say like of a train or a truck or something, its momentum is related to its mass times its speed. But light has no mass. I'm not trying to speak Spanish and say no mass. I'm saying uh, light has no mass. Because of that, then you might think, oh, well, if mass is zero, then momentum is zero. But nope, there's a new equation. This is actually the sort of, some people call this the de Broglie equation, but it goes like this, P equals H over lambda. That's the new one then. Okay, so P is the momentum. That's measured in kilogram meters per second, normally. But we can also have other units as well here. H is still just a constant. And lambda is the wavelength. So if we know the wavelength, in other words, the color of light, which is measured in meters, by the way, if we know the wavelength of light, then we can know how much momentum it will have. Momentum is all about, uh, I mean, you can actually transfer force from one thing to another. You can transfer momentum. Um, so what that means is that light can actually push things. Uh, it's actually what we call a radiation pressure. This actually explains how a star can actually be in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. In other words, how come the force of gravity, which should be crushing a star, is being held back by the light of the star itself? Because the light going outwards has a radiation pressure. And pressure is related to momentum. Okay, so as you have uh, light can actually push on things, which sounds really weird, right? Because when I have light hitting me, I don't feel like I'm being pushed, but I am just a tiny bit.
that also explains some really neat designs for, uh, for example, of a solar sail. In other words, you could actually get to another star. Um, believe it or not, this is actually a viable way. It's just not practical. We don't know how to engineer it yet. But you could have, for example, a little spaceship. And imagine you had a big, big sail. I mean, gigantic, like kilometers wide. It's a big, giant, really lightweight material. You point that sail, so to speak, at, let's say you're the sun over there. So the sun's light will actually give uh, pressure on this thing, and this thing will actually go. And it turns out the math works really well. Theoretically, there's no problem with this. You could totally take a ship, do this, and it turns out you'd be able to go really fast. It's one of the best ways to get around, believe it or not. Uh, and then, of course, what happens is, as you get further away, there's less pressure, but you're already moving, so you have some, uh, you know, you tend to go in straight lines. Remember Newton's laws. So if you're going in a straight line, you'll tend to go in a straight line. And of course, once you get near the star you want to get to, just use some thrusters to turn it around, basically. And that way, when it comes towards the star, then it sort of does some braking. It sort of slows down as the star sort of forces it this way. In theory, it works great. In practice, you'd need a sail that's so big, we don't know yet how to make a sail that's that big that won't sort of collapse and rip apart. We don't know how to make materials of that way. But solar sails, totally, theoretically, no problem with them. And that's because light has a pressure. In other words, light has momentum. It's able to transfer momentum from one thing to another. So, particles can act like waves. Waves can act like particles. We have this wave-particle duality of light. And we also have that, uh, yeah, we can use this equation right here to relate things. So this P becomes the same thing as P equals MV. Believe it or not, you can even find your own wavelength. May not make much sense, but you can. You can actually calculate your wavelength. Um, and that's actually done because if you can calculate your momentum. If you're actually moving, then your mass times your velocity is equal to this P. And this P is equal to H over lambda. So you can convert and find your own wavelength. Turns out your wavelength will be really, really, really small. And it doesn't make much sense to imagine myself with a wavelength, but we really do. Which means in certain conditions, I suppose, we could be diffracting. But that's not uh, practical and it's not likely. But electrons, which are very, very small, uh, if you just shoot them out, they can actually diffract. And we use some really neat quantum effects with some of this stuff right here to actually make things like um, electron microscopes. Because uh, electrons can do really weird things. It turns out um, quantum mechanics has a lot of really strange uh, results has results based on probabilities of doing things. We're going to see that in the next videos. Um, but it turns out really weird things can happen. So for example, electrons, there's actually a chance. If I keep tapping you know, my hand like this, there is a chance, not zero, that my hand will actually, my finger will actually go through my hand. The good news is the chance is very, very small. That's why solid things are still solid. Uh, science, sometimes that's called the correspondence principle, that you know, your, your ideas better work in large scale and in real life situations. So solid things should, still should feel solid. But it turns out um, there is a chance that it actually goes through. Not that it makes a hole, it'll just, just be somewhere else. Now electrons, though, they're a lot smaller. So if you have a small, thin material and you have electrons firing at a material, there is a chance that they'll actually go through. And that chance is not zero. So if you fire enough electrons at a thin enough thing, they actually penetrate, they go right through. Now, this is really cool, I think. But thankfully though, uh, solid things still feel solid because all of my, uh, every atom in my body would have to decide, or at least in my finger, would have to decide at the same time to go through everything in my hand. Those chances are vanishingly small, they're you know, super small probabilities. That's why we're not worried. Solid things still stay solid. But if you have small enough things, like little electrons being you know, thrown at something really thin, they can actually go through. And that's really weird. They don't actually make a hole. They just start off on one end and then come out the other end. You could have a detector and actually pick them up. You could be like, bloop, there's an electron. It went through. So it does happen. So quantum mechanics does some weird things. But the non-weird stuff, at least, is this right here that we've just learned about. I just want to give a bit of a primer on uh, what quantum mechanics can do for us. It does all sorts of really cool stuff that we never would have thought of and we never would have thought possible. Uh, so there we go, de Broglie hypothesis, uh, momentum relating to H over lambda.